Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasslash, episode 366 for February 24 of 2017. Concours, Cuba, and cars you can't afford. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of AutoLine After Hours. Gary, how you doing? I'm doing great. You and I were in San Antonio this week driving the Jeep Compass, which we'll talk about later. But, you know, if we went outside right now, it's like San Antonio here in Detroit. Uh, I, it's amazing. For February, I, it's like a summer day out there. We, we, we just don't see this kind no, of we stuff don't. very often. I'm driving with convertibles at the top down and the winter tires on. <laughs> <laughs> And that voice, everybody, is Frank Marcus from Motor Trend, and it's great to have you back here. Always Frank. great to be here. Cool. And we got to let everyone know our special guest today is Bill Warner. Mm-hmm. Let's see, photographer, writer, race driver, co-founder of the Amelia Island Concours. Yeah. Is that all right? So I, far, so good. So, so far, so good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, family man. Yeah. But, yeah, I try to squeeze as much into this life as I can. Well, it's so great that you're on the show, and the concours is coming up in another couple of weeks. Yeah, I don't sleep very well right now. No? Come yeah. on. I thought this would be well-oiled machinery. It is, but when you're rolling a couple of million bucks on the weather, you, <laughs> it's something you can't control. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's it's always a, a worry until you know, people say, uh, are you getting any rest? I said, on March 13th. After the after concours. The show. So, so we had you on the show a couple of years ago. Yeah. How has it gone since then? Very well. It's uh, it's grown, and uh, we've expanded to a third fairway, which we use uh, for a lot of corporate presence. And uh, uh, I don't know if if growth is always a good thing. You know, it, it loses kind of its personal touch when it gets too big. But it got to the point we had the crowd lined up, and the sheriff wanted them off the roads and streets. So we opened up another fairway just to, for staging purposes. So yeah, it's grown a lot. Uh, this year we're doing a lot of themes, but one of our main themes is the Japanese performance, Japanese power, which no one else has done before. And the exciting thing for me, it took us a year to get it, is the Richie Ginther Honda. Oh, Formula One car. Formula One car from the 1965 Mexican Grand Prix. The first major win uh, by a Japanese car on the world stage. Mm -hmm. So we got that. We got the Mazda 787B, the first Japanese car to win Le Mans. We got the Nissan. First Japanese car to win Sebring. We got the Toyota. First Japanese car to win uh, Daytona 24-hour. Peter Brock car. We got a, a 2.5 Trans Am car. Uh, we got a the Datsun 510. Yep. How about the Good 2000 car. GT though? Yes, the Toyota 2000 GT. Yeah. Yes, we have one of the two coming. Good. Good. Yeah. And um, one of Sam Posey's cars, Bob Sharp car. So that's going to be. A great display. We're doing streamliners, which I'm really excited about. We've got the Spirit of Rhett. What's that? That is um, Charlie Nearberg's Bonneville car. Huh. It uh, he ran, uh, I think, an average of 414 miles an hour, single engine, normally aspirated. Wow. The car is like 38 feet long and 30 <laughs> inches wide. And they said, "How are we going to get it on a golf course?" So his team has made up a cradle to cradle a car so we can move it around because they said it's so narrow that it digs in and rolls over if you don't. So we got that. We've got the Mercedes-Benz 540K Streamliner. We got the Oldsmobile Aerotech. And then I got a Streamliner from every discipline. I got the K&K Dodge, which set speed records at Bonneville and Daytona, won the Firecracker 400. I was going to say, NASCAR car. NASCAR car. You know, the, was that uh, Tim Richmond driving that? No, that was uh, Bobby Isaacs. Oh, Isaac, right. Yeah. What and Streamliner did that have? Uh, the, it was the, the Superbird. The, oh, right. the, the, oh, yeah. The, the slope right, rose right, in the wing. Right, yeah, yeah. The streamlined NASCAR car. We got the Sumar Special, which was the only full-bodied streamlined car. Well, like the Epperly Special was one of two uh, for Indy, 1955 Indy. It's got a canopy and, you know, full-body. Uh, we've got uh, Don Garlitz is letting us have Jocko Streamliner, the first full-bodied streamliner dragster. Hmm. We got the Van Wall, the first really streamlined Formula One car. Um, so we've got NASCAR, drag racing, IndyCar, um, 
We got the, the battery box, which was the first electric car to go over 175 miles an hour. So uh, the, the streamline class is going to be a lot of fun. Got Mormon here. Meteor? No, we're working on something. I can talk about that next year. Le Jamais Contente? <laughs> Do you know that one? Yeah. It's the, the first car to ever go 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers mm -hmm. an hour, uh, in France in, I want to say, 1898. And it looks like a torpedo on oh, four wheels. Oh, I know what wheels. you're talking about. Yeah, look, it sits way up on the wheels. It sits way up, exactly. But yeah. I, I think it is the first aerodynamically shaped race car. Yep. Uh, we tried to get the... Nazis or whatever, yeah. No. Yeah, we tried to get the Alfa Romeo torpedo, uh, I think in 1914, but... Uh, you know, shipping costs and insurance from Italy are pretty strong. But uh, that's going to be exciting. We're doing movie cars with the James Bond, Aston Martin, the American Graffiti 58 Chevy, the Nart, uh, Ferrari Nart Spider from the Thomas Crown Affair, the Porsche 917 from Le Mans, and uh, uh, the uh, Morgan from War of the Roses and uh, Rain Man Buick. No Le Kirby, the Volkswagen? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of funny. We did advertising cars one year, right? We had the, the Moxie Rolls Royce with the big white horse. We had the Zippo Lighter Chrysler with the flame. And someone said, are you getting an Oscar Mayer Wiener in a mobile? I said, no, everybody knows that. I'm, I want stuff that people didn't know existed. And people come up to you today and said, boy, I love that advertising car. That was Oscar Mayer Wiener mobile was really cool. I said, it wasn't there. <laughs> but, you know, people perceived that it was. Yeah. How do you pick these themes? Over a six-pack of Guinness. Yeah. yeah. Best way to do it. <laughs> it is. We, we would sit down and say, well, what are we going to do? And, and we always like to do something goofy uh, to entertain folks who don't like cars. And some other racing stuff. It looks like oh. you've got, I, I, I'm holding up right now, the, the program. For Al Unser the, Sr. is honoring And him. Al Unser Sr. is on the cover. So you're honoring him too, obviously. Yeah. We've got all four of his Indy winners uh, coming. And we'll Borg won a trophy. Now, last year we did a trophy display of 11 of the best trophies in the world. And then we had them on display in the lobby of the Ritz Carlton in cabinets we had built for them. It was really, it would knock you out. You know, we had the Harley Earl trophy, the Borg Warner trophy, the Wheeler Shebler trophy. You familiar with that one? No. That was given out at Indy before the Borg Warner. Six feet of sterling silver by Tiffany's. Wow. We had guards on it the whole time. The Le Mans trophy from 4965, that was the first win for Ferrari, last win for Ferrari. Uh, I said I mentioned the Harley Earl Trophy, the Stevens Trophy, the, the uh, Cannonball Trophy, the Maurice G. Bauer bust. <laughs> but what people didn't know was when they got out on the field on Sunday, each cabinet was there with each trophy, and alongside of it was a car that won that trophy. And that's kind of hard to top. Yeah, no kidding. But we have a Borg Warner Trophy coming back to be with the four Indy winners. And we found the 1957 Le Mans Trophy, and then our feature is D-Jags, and we've got the 56 and 57 D-Jags at one at Le Mans with the trophy. So we try to do different things. So who's got all these trophies? Because I know, like, with the Borg Warner trophy, isn't that at Indianapolis? Yeah, and Ellen Byerly really helped us out with that. She had the Stevens trophy, which was speed runs that the Cord won, and Cord was our featured mark last year. She also has, you know, the, the, the Smithsonian is, uh, I'll go on record saying this, they're very impo impossible to work with. They have the Vanderbilt Cup and stored away where no one can see it, but they won't loan it out. And they sent me the message that, we couldn't have the Vanderbilt Cup because a hotel they didn't think was a proper venue to display it. The first time the Vanderbilt Cup was awarded was at a hotel. I mean, that shows you what they know about history. Thank you. You can address your mail to ameliaconcord.org from the <laughs> Smithsonian. Um, so we had 11, 11 trophies, and uh, Ellen Byerly really helped us out on that. And once we got Indy committed, I called Joey Chitwood down at Daytona and said, this is what Indy's doing. What can you do for us? So they sent us up the uh, Harley Earl Trophy, which was terrific. So um, they're out and about. The Le Mans Trophy uh, uh, is uh, uh, the gentleman who owns it. Uh, someone called him and says, you got a D-Jag. I found this in a garage sale in South Africa. And there it is. It's amazing you can track this stuff down. We stayed wired all year long. When we get a theme, we beat it to death. And there's a couple of themes we've been working on that I can't talk about because we keep that pretty close to the vest. But we've worked 10 years to get a particular theme worked mm -hmm. out and uh, make sure we, we vetted everything properly and uh, source it out. You can do some Camaros this year. Yeah. 50th anniversary of Camaro, but we're, we're doing the rare Camaros. Um, the class will be one of the Sunoco Camaros. From and the Trans Am days. From the Trans Am days. That's a dipped. Yes. 
Yeah, all those cars were back then. Chemical milling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, we'll have a Baldwin Motion and a Yenko and a Bill Mitchell Camaro and uh, about uh, six or seven really, really rare, unusual Camaros. One of the pace cars. And we'll have Camaro number one. So, so where's, where's Camaro number one? Held at. I mean, is Jim Heritage no, Center. No, uh, a gentleman has it, and uh, really? we had it on the show it from, yeah. last year. They brought it to the Dream Cruise yeah. here in Detroit yeah. last yeah. year. Yeah, it lives up in this part of the country. Huh. It's a uh, it's a fascinating story because it's really a hand built production car, six cylinder too, and six cylinder at that. Yeah. But I, I was astonished. I mean, back then they built cars differently than today. You know, today you build all. You know, 150 pre-production cars to make sure you get crush them all at the end, and then you start job one, the real job one. Not back then. They'd cobble stuff together. In fact, he he told us that when they put the car together, it didn't even have the Camaro nameplate on it. Chevrolet had not even named the car when they started building it. No Panther. And they had to drill a couple of holes in the the sheet metal to put the Camaro badges on it. Yeah, they used them at all the dealer uh, promotional events, you know, and the uh, dealer bought it off the, you know, at at the last promotional event or something. Mm -hmm. I think uh, some of the early Mustang prototypes, you know, they hadn't named it Mustang yet. It had a a cougar or a cat emblem in the the front of it. So that's not unusual. The car's developed before the name is. Mm -hmm. By the way, Jim Taylor is a gentleman with the Le Mans trophy, and he got the call from some guy. He says, you got a DJ? You probably need this trophy. Um, I think trophies are uh, long-term. Right ones are good investments. And that whole idea came was I was at the Mila Melia, and Donald Osborne came up and said, look at this. This is the Mila Melia trophy. Isn't that cool? I said, yeah. He says, wouldn't it be cool to match the car up to it? I said, wouldn't it be cool to match 11 or 12 cars up to trophies? So we get an idea. It may start out as an acorn, but we try to grow it into an oak tree. I never thought of that. Trophies, you think, could be a good investment from I a collector's so. standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think car collecting's going in the future? Because in the U.S. right now, and I'll bet this is true globally, we have the fewest percentage of teenagers with driver's license. And it's not just teenagers, by the way. Fewer and pu- fewer people driving. And, you know, when, when you look at certain cars, I'll, I'll say the brass cars, some of the great stuff from mm-hmm. the 20s and 30s, is a young generation going to aspire to those cars? Are they going to oh, hold their value? I think that's, that's the fear. Now, a lot of people said that about brass cars. And when they started having tours, and people wanted a brass car to, to qualify for a tour. The old brass cars came with the big brass, you know, like a Thomas Flyer or something. Um, there's a new buyer in the auction market, and, and I don't know if this is a trend, but at the, the RM auction in Paris last month, uh, I kind of watched certain cars I have an interest in, and Ferrari Daytonas have kind of leveled off. And they've, if, in fact, they've dropped a little bit. But they had a 1995 Porsche Turbo Cabriolet. Now, they claimed it was one of 14 built. To me, it's a used car. You know, I don't want to offend anybody. It's a used car. <laughs> 1.3 million euros what? worth of used car. Wow. Now, you got to think about that. There are at least two people who wanted that car. But one point, why would a, a turbo Carrera Cabriolet be worth double or perceived to be worth double of a Ferrari Daytona? I don't understand it. No, I don't understand that at all. I think the younger buyers, the younger wealthy people, want the Zumi cars. They want the Ferrari Enzo, the F50, the F40, the uh, uh, Carrera, the, the, you know. The, uh, but what I happens think. to all the Duesenbergs and Packards and Cords and cars Those like people that? people are dead. <laughs> the, the people that, no, I think Duesenbergs, you know, there's certain evergreens, and Duesenbergs have to be a, uh, a you know, a Stutz Bearcat has to be an evergreen, kind of like a 427 Cobra. If, you, if you're a serious collector, you got to have those. Mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of the cars from the 30s, I think, are they're leveled off or going but, down. But to John's point, is, is the collector a different person now than they were 10 years ago? Yeah. Um, an interesting one. I, I was <laughs> studying Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Gullwing prices, and they've leveled off, and in some cases have dropped a little bit. So I called the expert on those, Paul Russell. I said, what's happening? He says, well, do you know the average lifespan that that a guy keeps a 300 SL? I said, no. He says, a 300 SL owner usually has had the car for 30 years. So let's say he bought it when he was 50, and he paid back then, round figures, 10 grand for it, which would have been big money. Now he's 80 years old, and he sees them up at about 1 to 1.2 million, 
and he doesn't want to stick his family with the burden of having to get rid of the car, and a million bucks looks pretty good, you know, to, to an 80-year-old. So a lot of them have come on the market, so now the supply and demand comes into play on that. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. But a, a Gullwing is an, another an iconic car. If you're a serious collector, you got to have a Gullwing. Totally agree. Hey, why don't we take a quick break? we got a lot sure. more things to talk to you about, but uh, Carmen, why don't we give a good shout out to one of the sponsors that makes this show possible, and that, of course, is Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back talking with Bill Warner. Hey, another thing that you've done recently is uh, put together a book about classic cars in Cuba. Yeah, Tom Cotter uh, and I did a book. Well, I started going to Cuba in 2009. Um, I went down to research the Cuban Grand Prix. Yeah, we got the, the cover of it yeah. up on the screen right now. And um, it was for the, we were going to do the, we did the anniversary of Sterling Moss's victory in uh, 1960. So I applied through the Treasury Department and got a permit to go down there. And I, I became captivated by uh, the ingenuity uh, and creativeness of the Cubans under the, the thumb of communism to keep these cars going, even with Russian diesel engines, you know. But you were after classic cars, right? I mean, collector cars. We were kind of after whatever we could find. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first four days, <laughs> we told our tour guide, he says, we, we want to go to a junkyard. He says, what do you mean a junkyard? I said, junkyard, you know, where old cars go to get scrapped. He says, the whole town's a junkyard. <laughs> right. So we didn't find anything on the first trip. The second trip, yeah, we found a couple of 300 SLs, Gullwing, Roadster, a, a beautiful car I, that I'd love to have. Uh, a 53 Chrysler Ghia, one of hmm. a dozen built. Very rare. Very right. rare. How did uh, that get there? It was just there before the revolution. Hmm. And the first cars got to Cuba first, very yeah. early on. Yeah. I, I want to yeah. say wealthy. 1910 or. Oh, way well, before that, they were. They had a race in Cuba, I think, in 1904. Whoa. And uh, there's supposed to be parts of a Benz Grand Prix car down there. There's supposed to be parts of a 49 Ferrari. We know there's a 550 Spider, but we couldn't see it because of political reasons. Everything's kind of... What do you mean, political reasons? Well, if, some, if the government knew that an asset like that was there, oh. it wouldn't be impossible for them to lay claim to it. Gotcha. Um, so are did, many of these cars driving around, or are they in collections? Oh, there's no collections to speak of that we could find. Mm -hmm. No, there are uh, not. Rich, Richie Klein's looking for six silver ghosts that are supposed to be down there. He hadn't found them yet. But as you know, there is a car club of Havana, and yep. though the cars in that club are in pretty good condition. Well, <laughs> well, you're, here, here's maybe, the concours. Maybe another <laughs> Island uh, condition. Pretty good condition. This is, well, and, and what's this? This looks like. Well, that was a little Ford Speedster we found over in Santiago de Cuba. The the owner uh, has uh, <laughs> left the country to go to Miami, and he can't get the car out, so it's just sitting there. But this looks like something that would have run at Indy. Yeah, the, Pre-1920. Well, they used to race on the, the, the horse tracks down there, hmm. little oval track. And in fact, there was a big midget contingent back in the 50s from America that went down there. We found one midget, or parts of it. Yeah, but that, that was probably the nicest old car we found down there. Um, but it's, it's there to stay. You can't take them out. The government won't let you export cars. So what was the newest car you saw there? Oh. Uh, this maybe Zill. what the hell is a that a Zill? Russian Chaika. Oh, Never heard of a Chaika. We we go to this this place and it was a shed that had about fifteen of these that the Russians left when they bailed out. And they had four point seven liter V eight, so they were hauling the engines out, taking the motors out, and putting in four four cylinder diesel tractor engines because they can't afford to run them. But this was left uh, by the by the Russians. It has a lot of Chrysler Packard look to it. Crushed velour interior. All right. Yeah. So what year would that be? Oh, that would have been in the 80s. Yeah. But they made them for like 20 years looking like that. That's really hard to pin down. That's right. So, so is that like serious gauge sheet metal that I mean? Well, I, I didn't get to tap on it, but I, it was probably made with a heavy hand. Yeah. yeah. This was a friend of mine, um, Ricardo Morales, and his wife going off on their uh, honeymoon in their BMW 507. There were two 507s in Cuba. We think there's one still there. Hmm. 
and we think it's this car. Could you ever do a deal with the government down there to say, bring them to the concours, I guarantee that they'll go back? Uh, I've given that thought. I seriously have. Uh, it would, it would uh, involve both the U.S. government and the Cuban government agreeing to that. But most of the stuff down there is really it's junk. pretty bad. It's junk. Yeah. No, no, no question. In the book, we say, you know, if, if you've been dreaming of going to Cuba and making a big deal on the cars, they're more expensive down there. We went to a shop that restores 50s cars to make taxi cabs because running a cab is a way of getting income in Cuba. And hard currency. And hard currency, yeah, under, under the table kind of you stuff. You get doctors doing, running to cabs because they can only buy certain things with the government money they get from doctoring. Yeah. And they have to get tourist money running a cab. Mm -hmm. We saw this it's 50, Uber here. This 56 Chevy Bel Air four door sedan, they had put a Kia, uh, Mitsubishi or Kia diesel engine in. I said, well, how much would this car cost? And they said 80,000 CUCs, which is about $90,000. I said, for where do they get the money? They're paid twenty dollars a month. Since oh, they're here, American. Here, here comes this big rich American who runs a big rich car show. You got to hire some local Cuban to go buy the thing <laughs> for eight hundred bucks. Well, no, I wasn't asking to buy it. I was just asking out of curiosity. They get their American families to buy it because it's a way they can get money to them. You know, um, but there's they they have the internet down there. When I looked at that Chrysler Ghia, I was salivating. I was like, how am I going to work this out? And a guy came out with a page out of eBay and an auction results. Here, this one sold for six hundred thousand dollars. So, I mean, these these folks are well they know informed. What they got. Sure, they do. They know what they got. Yeah. So at, at the concours, getting yeah. back to that, how many cars will be there in all? So if somebody is thinking about going, you know, what are they going to see? Uh, Three hundred of the rarest cars you can you can think of. Yeah. And then on Saturday we have a free show with 400 cars. And there's some cars in that free show that could <laughs> qualify very easily for the Sunday show. Mm -hmm. we, we call the Saturday show hamburger and the Sunday show filet, you know. <laughs> we sell tickets for the, we're, we're a 501c3 charitable, so you know, we're, we're raising funds for charity. But yeah, it, um, and then we got five auctions on the island. And right. RM is our official auction at the Ritz. But you got RM, Gooding, Bottoms, and a couple of others. But you mentioned, you, maybe you're on the verge of getting too big? I think we've outgrown the island. Uh, the expense of doing the show usually jumps fifty to hundred thousand dollars every year with increase. If, if the hotel raises their rates, the condos raise their rates. Uh, uh, we had a storage lot we were using uh, for years, and we'd give the guy forty tickets and a, and a table at the dinner to just to use his lot. He came to me one year and says, "If you want the lot, it's fifty thousand dollars." I said, "Well, that's five hundred dollars per trailer to park it." He says, "Either fifty grand, or you don't get it." So I called the mayor up. I said, how important is this show to you? He said, very important. I said, you find me a place to put 100 trailers by 2 o'clock this afternoon. It has to be within a mile of the field. So they closed the taxiway at the airport for us. Wow. But we still have to pay 20 grand for it because in order to close a taxiway, the FAA won't permit it unless you show there's a benefit to the airport. So, mm -hmm. you know, it keeps ratcheting up every year. And <laughs> I keep telling the folks there, you're going to kill the goose that lays a golden egg. Mm -hmm. And they just... They smile and say, I hear you. I said, you may hear me, but you're not listening. Mm -hmm. So for the auctions, what are some of the marquee vehicles that will be on auction? Oh, well, the one car I would salivate over if I had the money at RM is the uh, Ferrari 250 GT short wheelbase Berlinetta, which they think will go for somewhere around $9 million. It's your, your money, Frank. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree that's one of those? Yeah, that sounds like cars. Nine million sounds high. Hasn't that thing gone for like seven and a half million or something like that? Well, the steel-bodied cars do. The alloy-bodied cars are up in the 15, 20 million range. Wow. You don't know till the day of the auction. And yeah. two guys need to show up? Yeah, That's right. Two guys with lots yeah, of money. really want it. So, so why is there such a big difference between the alloy cars and the steel cars? And well, the alloy cars are generally the comp cars mm -hmm. and have some history. Lighter, rarer, you know, mm -hmm. so... The alloy cars will always, you know, like a Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Gullwing we were talking about, steel-bodied car, million two, million three, an alloy-bodied car, five, six million. They look the same. If you walked up to them on the street, you couldn't tell the difference. Keep a magnet with you. Yeah. <laughs> Even though we talked earlier that, you know, maybe a younger generation may or may not be interested in cars, sounds like at least at this snapshot in time. Your concourse is just rocking here. Well, we've tried to appeal to a younger audience in a lot of stuff. You know, we'll, 
we'll do things uh, other shows won't do. Like what? Jeremy. Like the advertising cars, for one, or oh. yeah. we do. We did a class called "What Were They Thinking?" where we went out and got the ugliest cars we could find. And Wayne Carini came up with a spun-bodied Ford that was about as ugly a car as you'd ever seen. And you you got to have some entertainment value. That we did cars of the cowboys mm -hmm. with the Leo Carrillo Chrysler with a bull's head on the front, and Roy Rogers' car with all the silver dollars and the guns and the carbines on the fenders. You know, people like that sort of stuff. What James Bond cars are you going to have? Well, the DB5, mm -hmm. the, uh, there were three built. The Goldfinger car. Goldfinger car. One in England, uh, there's one here in the United States, and then one was stolen years ago. Hey, out what's of the latest on that? Is that? Has that ever shown up? No. We did a big story about that in Motor Trend Classic. Yeah. No, no never showed up. All I know is that out of the Grundy insured it, and he was pretty angry. It might have been even Jacksonville Airport. One of the last. Boca Raton. Okay, but yeah. Yeah, they, they found the tire tracks where it was drug out, and then it just disappeared. One of two things happened. The guy put it in the Gulf Stream and collected the insurance, or it's in a private collection never to be seen. One of the two. It will be seen again at some point. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like all these stolen paintings. No, at it's... some point in history, they turn up again. Well, you know, a lot of concept cars are that way. I won't mention companies, but they were supposed to be scrapped, and the people and the, the employees couldn't bring it in their heart to scrap one of these concept cars, so they just kind of went away. And now, 30 or 40 years later... They're popping up. Yeah, but and Joe Borg owns the person line. <laughs> <laughs> There's, you know, it's, uh, that's the question, you know. Well, there was a, a junkyard here in the Detroit area that was famous for War, war hoops, sure. exactly. Yeah, Warholic, yeah. That's where Bortz Joe Bortz got all his. Drug all his out of there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I and, know of a couple of concept cars that are here in Detroit. That I've wanted to get them to the show. They're just not coming out of the garage. <laughs> Is that because <laughs> no one knows that they are owned Probably. and exist? Yeah. yeah, I don't know the story. Uh -huh. I have to assume that the reason why they don't want the car seen was the car was supposed to be destroyed and wasn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, is those cars, especially if you look at ones from the 50s, very, they were not meant to be seen in the year 2017. No. I mean, you move them around, stuff starts breaking. In 54, General Motors sold some of their cars, like the Cadillac Le Mans. They made four of them. Mm -hmm. And one went to Harry Carl, who was a shoe magnet, who was married to uh, Marie McDonald and later Debbie Reynolds. Mm -hmm. It built, it, Barris remodeled it. It burned in a garage fire, so it's gone. Uh, General Motors has one, and there's a guy named Scott uh, Milestone in uh, uh, Maryland who has an original unrestored Cadillac Le Mans. The mm -hmm. first style? Because they kind of restyled yeah, the one that... Yeah, EM restyled yeah. it. But if you look at them, you know, they, they were, like you said, they were built for shows. Some of them were just pushmobiles. The, the Cadillac Eldorado Brome Town Car never had an engine until about five years ago. <laughs> it was a pushmobile. Uh, but... I had a concept. Well, it was a kind of the Buick Landau, which was a four door with a Landau top in the back. I found that on, uh, thanks to Rick Zeigler in California, I found it on eBay <laughs> and bought the car. So you never know, stuff shows up. It does. Well, Bill Warner, thanks so much for coming on. This thanks, is John. Terrific it's a pleasure here. And so everybody knows March 12th. 10th, 11th, and 12th. 10th, 11th, and 12th, 12th being the, the, the capstone day. day. Yep. Right, uh, at Amelia Island. So uh, for everybody who's listening, who's get a chance. You, you just got a little preview of what's going to go on there. It's 82 degrees there today. <laughs> Real good. Well, we're going to take a short break. We got other things, but Bill, it's been awesome having you here. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. You bet. Okay, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we got more to talk about of what's been going on in this crazy car business. There's only one talk show that covers the issues and executives that drive the auto industry. Turn to AutoLine this week, every Friday at AutoLine.tv or on your local PBS stations across America. AutoLine this week. You can't get more inside the industry. Okay, we're back. And uh, very interesting. I, I mean, it, it's amazing how you can get so many unique cars like that. That's a ton of work. Yeah, just to organize it. And none of that sounds like a retread of something we saw at Pebble or, you know, it's always great new ideas and, you know, fresh a take on the, on the, the subject matter. You know, I, I like what you asked him. How do you come up with the ideas? Well, I mean, you know, I think it's interesting if, if, if you think about it. I mean, because we were talking about how, you know, there may not be as great an interest in cars today. But 
for people who are even got an inkling of, of interest that, you know, by having these, these different ideas, these different types of vehicles, that, you know, it might engender some enthusiasm or interest in, in going forward. So it could be a good thing for the industry, right? You know, I mean, for people buying new cars rather than, you know, exotic things that. Well, it's interesting. I haven't been to Amelia, but if you go to the, the local St. John's Concours or the Dream Cruise or even Pebble, which I've been at a number of times, is there are a lot of little kids that, you know, people bring along with them and they generally love these cars. Mm -hmm. But again, these are very special cars, very great styling or grand proportions or something unique about them. You know, right. it's, uh, it's not like a, a run of the mill Civic or something like mm -hmm. that. And I'm not trying to put the Civic down, but you guys know what I mean. Sure. Yeah, th these days you build, you know, 500,000 of something that comes in essentially three or four, you know, colors. shapes. And, and very few colors, and they all kind of look mm -hmm. alike. Back in those days, man, yeah. you know, one of 11, well, you, probably everyone's one of one when you really right. get down to it. There was so many ways to mm -hmm. personalize everything, you know. Yeah. Or okay. Tom Cool's joke last week about the interiors of sedans, 50 shades of gray. Yes. <laughs> it's still a great yeah. joke. That Yuck. is. Okay, it's that part of the show where, drum roll please, trumpets blare, it's time for Dr. Data. Okay, so this, this one, um, this should be fairly easy, okay? So I think, I think yeah, you guys... Yeah, because you've stumped us the I, last I think you guys days. are going to get this. So Carmen, please bring up the, uh, the first uh, slide, please. Okay, so in the last five years, 22 million drivers in the United States spent 15.4 billion dollars. How come they spent that money? Hmm. I got one guess because there's been some stuff on the news about how much rust from throwing salt on the roads costs people. But I don't remember that 15.4 billion. That but I'm going to guess even for like broken wheels and. Uh, what? What do you think, Frank? I, well. Uh... Hmm. Yeah, like road damage to the cars. I don't know. Well, look at the look at the the picture. Oh, that's so you're just blurry. cheating. You're cheating. Well, I can't tell what it is, but it, it looks like an arm sticking in. It, Unnecessary oil changes. No. Okay. All right. That that was good. Carmen, answer please. So you are right, John. Oh. This was from salt and deicers on the road, huh. destroying vehicles. So, we, uh, so this side is, galvanized. This is, we're not rusting through, but we're rusting out. Yeah, but look at this: fuel brake lines, lines so. fuel tanks, exhaust systems. Wow. So this was this is from AAA. So this is a legitimate source. So uh, there you have it. There you it's a lot of money. Yeah. So, like, so when do we pay get, one way or you pay the other? Yeah. <laughs> except for, except for as we were saying earlier, it's uh, I don't know 70 degrees outside right People now. People aren't willing to spend one billion on a gas tax increase that might fix the roads. Yeah. But, Mm. Happy to pay fifteen billion <laughs> to fix right. the car. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. Well, good, good choice there, Gary. And let's go back to what we were talking about earlier. You and I were both driving the the Jeep Compass this week right. down so in we San Antonio, Texas. Can't talk pricing. Can't talk drive impressions. Can't talk fuel MPGs, economy. That's right. 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 But we can talk about everything else. Yeah. And. Uh, Boy, I'll tell you that car. So you know, we we've had the the Compass previously and when it came out it was the Compass Patriot and that was because um, I'm trying to remember Wolfgang Bernhardt wanted the Compass and maybe Dieter wanted the Patriot or vice versa. And I can I go on record as being deeply disappointed they did not call this car the Compatriot. <laughs> It's a great name. That's pretty clever. It, I, I offered this to them at the, at the long lead press preview and I said free of charge you know as an alumnus of Chrysler I want you to have this. No. But anyway. Yeah. They didn't take it. No they didn't. It's pitiful. So, so now they've gotten rid of the Patriot. So now they just have the Compass. So the Compass has to do all the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's like this car, I would submit, is, you know, a, a, a real effort for Jeep brand to conquer the globe. Well, what's the over-under on, will, uh, will the Renegade or this one be the biggest seller globally? Because I guess they're both going to be made in most of the same plants, right? they got four plants making right. the Compass. I don't know how many Renegade plants there are. I want to say three. I think it's three. Maybe. But that's a good question. Because there's not one here. Right. But the other three, though, for the global that want the smaller vehicles. Here, you always got the numbers. What's their best-selling vehicle? I, I, I'm going to say it's the Grand Cherokee. Here. Here but, in the U.S. But I think they oh, sell but globally. Re renegades as they yeah, do everything yeah. else now because it's yeah. in three plants around the world. So I want, I've been wondering whether they think the bigger compass will 
sell more, or, or of course they're now. They're, I think they're talking about making a smaller yet vehicle, not for here, but for the smaller than Renegade. Which makes me think Renegade would still be outselling this one, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. But well, well, last month the Grand Cherokee was by far the biggest seller that they had. But, but that's, uh, but that's here. But, that, but that's here. Yeah, and I mean, and, and so if you think about places like Europe or Asia, I mean, they were talking about um, how in the segment that it competes in, so the compact SUV segment, that in Asia, four million cars were sold last year. Four million here, it's under uh, one million. So uh, you, know, you got to believe that uh, Mike Manley is looking around the world and saying, you know what, that's where we need to be. No and, question. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, I, uh, I looked this up. I'm, I'm blown away by their sales. As recently as 2012, they were selling in the U.S. market under half a million. Uh, last year, they sold a million pretty much in the U.S. They sold a million four globally. And I was actually surprised by how small that number is. I mean, if you can do a million in North America, you should be able to do a million in China. You should be able to do a million in Europe. You should be able to do how many others in the rest of the world. And so they're on target. They did a million four last year globally. They're on target to be at two million at the end of next year. And I said to Manley, why not three million? He goes, yeah, I know. I think we could do that. Right. Well, I think we're still building the brand in those other locations, you know, where they don't have, you know, the World War II history is, right. you know, front of mind and so forth. So, yeah, but it's very powerful. And, of course, that's the, you know, the, the, the jewel in the FCA crown. You know, if, if that thing is going to get sold, right. they're going to junk everything else. That's yeah, right. And, and, don't forget, so. and don't forget that, you know, their sales in Asia weren't all that great because for... They're just getting going. They, they, they had the deal with, um, you know, they were the first to have a JV. And then, yeah. it, then it... Beijing Jeep. Right. And then, it, then when the Daimler bought Chrysler, then that thing went away. And uh, so it's just been a couple of years that yeah. they've, they've... Chrysler really and Beijing there. Jeep hated each other. This is what people on the inside tell mm -hmm. me. Nothing went right. Right. And even when Daimler came in, they said, okay, we, we've got good relations with the Chinese and we'll get it straightened out. They mm -hmm. couldn't do it either. Right. So and Beijing it, Jeep is gone. I mean, it's not anything to do with Chrysler whatsoever. You know, one of the things that I was interested about was, I, so I was talking to Mark Allen, who is the um, head of design for, for Jeep. And, uh, you know, we, we hear about a lot of car companies that are beginning to sort of tailor their vehicles for other markets, mainly China, saying, okay, that's, that's going to be an important market for us, and therefore we'll make sure that this, this is very appealing. And he said, you know what? This, this, is, you know, this is quintessentially the American brand. We're going to design Jeeps as Jeeps, and we're not going to deviate from that. And, uh, Although i got to tell you, if I look at the D-pillar on the Compass, I see a little bit of French Citroen-ness to it. And they've got this... The shark uh, fin. <laughs> kind of, well, they call it... The but floating roof kind of thing. The floating it's roof the, thing. It's the big deal and, everywhere. And now the their floating boat. roof, though, carries through the A-pillars as an option. So they've blacked out, painted black, the A-pillars. That, to me, is much more French than American. But I would say, other than that, absolutely. The rest of the vehicles, absolutely American. Seven slot grill, yeah, right. trail rated badge, red tow hooks, you know. Yeah, and you know, I mean, and, and they really, I mean, because because again, Mark was saying that um, when they're developing Jeeps, you either go to the Grand Cherokee or you go to the Wrangler for your inspiration. And he said, you know, this one clearly is Grand Cherokee, and uh, so you have that more upscale. Because as you were saying, the Renegade, which is a big seller in other parts of the world has the more boxy Wrangler like uh, um, shape to it. Yeah, he was saying, Mark Allen, to me that they, they kind of stumbled onto this design that, oh, make it look a lot like the Grand Cherokee, but at a whole lot less money than what a Grand right. Cherokee. I, I think it's a winning formula from sure. a sales standpoint. Sure, and a package that's easy to park and, you know, all that. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a Jeep. I mean, we can't say it's it's a jeep oh yeah no i mean this thing is is rock solid the outgoing compass let's face it that was an orphan car that's left over from the daimler chrysler days it never got the investment that it needed yeah and, and but the engine kind of soldiers on in this one do you think that's gonna one engine for this this market is gonna 
and that engine in particular? I, well, it's naturally without aspirated. talking about what it's like to drive. Yeah, yeah, it's it's naturally aspirated, and, and it's uh, there's only only so much that you can do with any four. Yeah. Once you start getting over yeah. three thousand RPM, every four gets buzzy. Yeah, and I. But to your point, Frank, I think they did not want to offer a V6. Because now, how do you distinguish this I'm from sure the Cherokee? Packages either, and it may not. My guess is this thing's going to sell just fine. But I think a turbo or but something. I, I, I'm with you. I think they should do a turbo. I, on paper, that you know, the old Compass with you know almost a very similar output was pretty darn slow. Right. And, uh, and CVT that yeah. wasn't very good. Well, they, they're saying that there are 17 global combinations of fuel-efficient powertrain options. So. We get well. We get three transmissions, yeah. right? So you can get six-speed automatic, um, six-speed manual, and nine-speed automatic. Nine-speed automatic. So, so there are lots of other engines in lots of other places I think in it the won't world. Be long before we see uh, something that gets the, t the t speed up a little bit. Yeah. Well, G Gary makes a good point. There are other engines in other right. markets, and but a turbo would be big in my book for that vehicle. You think yeah. they'd do a diesel here? You know, I, I still think that there's a room for diesel in anything that looks truckish. Uh, you know, I'm concerned about the new cruise diesel. People going, mm, not in cars, but I think the Equinox diesel. I, I bet that thing has a higher penetration. We'll we'll see. I could mm -hmm. be all wrong. Yeah, we'll see. You know, Ram does terrific with its three-liter diesel. Sure. So, I mean, within the FCA, you know, sure they know Ford how to do, will do it. Great on theirs as well. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but, but that may go to your point of it. Looks like a truck, acts like a truck, yeah. drives like a truck. You, you, you want that torque, as I might have to carry stuff, you know. I mean, it makes more sense there than I think it does in cars at the mm -hmm. moment. Speaking of uh, new cars and all, what, what do you guys make of uh, Tesla saying that the, the Model 3 will be in production starting in July? Line speed by September. Well, there'll be a lot less people pulling their thousand bucks out if they get... Okay, do we know how many thousand people have, or how many people have taken their money out? I mean, I... I, I don't. Yeah, it, it'd no. be curious, but... Um, Probably something close to the number of people who only put it in there to get the stock price to go up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, the stock has gone up 54% in the last Mission year. Mission accomplished. Can I have my thousand bucks back? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I looked it up. A year ago, it was $100 a share, almost 100 like $97 and change cheaper than it is right now today. Yep. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a nice, hefty increase. So Elon said when he was talking to investors yesterday that there would be producing over 5,000 Model 3s per week, quote, at some point in the fourth quarter, and 10,000 vehicles per week, quote, at some point in 2018. What do you think, Frank? You know, good for him if he manages to do it. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of folks jumping ship over there and whatever. I, I, you know, but I will never be the one that says this guy can't get something done. Because, Not anymore. <laughs> no. I mean, he's, you know, he's got space things yeah, it's happening. It's on the way to the space station I mean, now, or maybe know, it's there. And Yeah. I mean, I, we, maybe you can ride a Hyperloop up to Palo Alto to pick out your colors by then, too. <laughs> you know. What do you think, John? I, I, I think that's awfully optimistic. You know, 10,000 a week is what, over half a million a year, and uh, which is what he's been talking about all along doing with that car. Uh, there's a lot of people who are skeptical, but I'm with you, Frank. I mean, okay, e even if he misses it by months, even if it's not 10,000, it's 7,000 a week, what the hell? I, uh, he's off to the races with those numbers. All right, so, so, so let me ask you, so I, I read this, this report part of this report this week from an outfit called Technavio, which basically says between 2017 and 2021 that there'll be a compound annual growth rate close to 38% of what they're calling high-performance electric vehicles. I mean, it, what, it's... Do you mean high-performance in terms of range, or do you mean high-performance in, in terms of two seconds, zero to 60 times? Uh, in terms of range, not they're they're not talking uh, zero to sixty times, but 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 then this number is even more startling. They're seeing a compound annual growth rate of more than one hundred and fifty one percent for electric SUVs. I'm not even aware of the existence. Well, of yeah, I mean, because you're going from zero to a, right. I mean, a so it's a compound annual growth rate. But I mean, do you think, Frank, that 
there will be sufficient number of people who are going to be buying Model 3s or Bolts or Leafs or Ionics or BMW i3s? Yeah, it, it, it's hard to see, you know, some kind of knee in the curve, you know, without some kind of big technological breakthrough. I mean, the 100 bucks per kilowatt hour, you know, is kind of a, a breakthrough, sort of, but I think... Is anybody besides Chevy getting that deal yet? Well, Chevy's not even there yet. I think they're at a, uh, for the cells. You know, and that's what somebody okay. from the DOE contacted me and said, whoa, 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 John, be careful when you talk price. There's the cells and there's the packs. Pack, yeah, sure. And the packs got, you know, everything assembled, the cooling, the wiring, blah, 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 blah. So you got to be careful how you, you talk about these costs. All right, so, so the cell is basically like a D cell. Correct. So just a regular and, old battery. Right. And then... But when you put it all together, then... Well, the what, so when we start throwing around numbers, oh, it's only $125 per kilowatt hour. Are you talking sell or are you talking pack? Right. And there's a big difference in that. So, and I, now I've exhausted all my knowledge about this uh, or shared all I know with and, you. And we, you. You hear about zinc air and all these other ideas coming up and whatever, and, and maybe one of those will plan out. I, you know... Anything's possible. Mm -hmm. I just think, you know, we've, NASA spent zillions of dollars on electric research for years and years and years because you don't refuel anything up there. You got little solar <laughs> panels and whatever, and the more, you know, and now, uh, you know, we've had a lot more effort going into it, and we're still inching forward. We're not, no one's had something that's like, oh, suddenly it's mm -hmm. double, you know. Right. It, it, so until something like that happens, it's, it's harder for me to see. I do think that if people really look into their, you know, hearts and souls, they can see that, you know, actually so many households have two cars. They do not both have to go to grandma's house, you know, uh, seven hours away. Most folks probably could get along with a 200-mile electric car as right. one of their cars right. and they would lower their their daily and weekly you know expenditure on transportation a bunch if they would do that mm -hmm. especially the way if you live in California you know they got these 98 dollar you know 500 e leases and whatever it's just like they're paying you to take the car mm -hmm. and they're taking a huge bath on it they make no money on it you know the company is is struggling to you know they hope nobody picks these things up but you know they're they're a great deal, and and I think a you know a bolt at three hundred at three grand after the yeah, that's a really good deal for that car. It's a really good car, and you're not paying road tax, you know, because you're plugging in at home, and there's no road tax coming through the you know. Although I got to tell you, I, I was uh, on, on this trip. I was driving with George Peterson. And we got talking about electrics, this very thing. So George is president of Auto Pacific. Uh, Auto Pacific Consultancy, right. And I said, he, he was saying, well, what do you pay for electricity in Michigan? And I said, well, at home for residential rates, all in taxes, distribution, and it's about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, for business, like in this building here, it's 10 cents with everything in. And he goes, oh. I said, so what do you pay in L.A.? He says, peak, 47 cents a kilowatt hour. I, I, I about fell over. Mm -hmm. Now, that's peak, 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 and this and that and the other thing. So if you're paying 47 cents per kilowatt hour, I can guarantee you gasoline's cheaper, even in California. Which is why all of these cars, I think, have this means by which you can time your charging. You can. So you go right. home and you tell it, okay, charge. No pays retail for electricity. And, and, yeah, and, char charge from 2 o'clock in the morning right. until... 315 or whatever. And he it is. said off peak, it's 13 cents. Right. Same as in Michigan. But, you know, you got to make sure that you're able to fully charge your car at the right time. You know, and I wonder on a more fundamental basis, I mean, so you don't need the, the seven hour drive to grandma's house and you can have this other car. How many people are just off put by the, by the whole idea of? You mean I don't put gas in this, and I've I've got to plug this in, and and, and it just you're onto right something there, Gary. No, I mean, it, you it, are. We just which think is why we've got the inductive charging just right around the corner. Where you, but, now you just pull into the parking lot. Not even that. And, Gary's getting to something more fundamental. It, it is so different. It is so outside of their experience. And even if they don't like going to the gas station, they right all there. know they have to plug this in every night. I don't see uh, why that's such. I, a I, I, think, I don't I either, Frank. I think, but I think, I think Gary's onto something because you never powered your phone by gasoline. So <laughs> maybe you did. I don't know. I mean, there was that there was that idea for a while that we were going to have uh, fuel cells for our laptop yeah, batteries. Right. Remember that? Yeah. But I mean, it just seems to me that that you know, 
we talk about these cars and it's it's nothing right i mean it, it does, you know we'll we'll drive a hydrogen powered mirai and all that you know and we'll be critical of that and i mean a normal person is going to go it's powered by what yeah. you know what i mean and and, 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 juice? Yeah. Yeah. Hey. and and it's just <laughs> you know and and i just i just really think that the the, the whole thing just is is not going to be you know, it's like somebody says, oh, well, you know, the Bolt will give you more than 200 miles. And the guy's thinking to himself, well, you know what? That Malibu I've got is going to give me more than 300 miles. You know, what? what's so exciting about this Bolt? Well, when you really look into it, though, I think the cost to operate the car is way less. Now, you know, the resale value is terrible on it because you know, if you look at the 37.5 purchase price, but the person only paid 30, and so when they go ready to sell it, in their mind, they're thinking of the 30. So uh, there's 7,500 that just, you know, kind of disappeared on the resale value right off the bat. Um, you know, and maybe the, you know, later on that, that kind of tapers off. But by and large, I think those, and they have no maintenance. You're not changing oil. You're not, you know. Okay, but again, how many people go buy a car and say, I'm going to do the math and see what that car costs me on an annual basis versus how many people go buy a car and say, damn, I really like this car? I yeah. Think my guess is not many people do the math. Right. That's my guess. Because it always, it's always occurred to me that, you know, when we talk about electric cars or hybrid cars, we all do, you know, we, we put our green eye shades on and we start calculating it. And it's just like, oh, you're never going to pay back on that with gas at such and such. But, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, somebody comes and says, oh, I just bought a Hellcat. Awesome. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and we never say, gee, you paid, you know, this much more. And you'll, you'll never get a payback on your Hellcat. Right. I mean, it's just like <laughs> you'll, you'll never be able to use all 709 horsepower. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, when the Volt first came out, everyone, that car somehow made everyone bust out their calculators. Right. You'll never pay this car back. Well, maybe I wanted the car because I, I, I wanted to stick it to the man at the, at the gas company, you know, oil companies. Maybe I bought it, you know, you're not getting the, the return on your, you know, Bang & Olufsen stereo. Right. No, that, that, that's know? the best point. I once bought a Saturn because I wanted a plastic car. I mean, there was no other reason. Yeah. It was insane. I just wanted a plastic engine. car. <laughs> hey, we got more things we, uh, that we've got to get to, but we've got to make sure that we pay some bills here. And we're going to give a shout out to our good friends at Bridgestone because that's the kind of sponsor that makes a show like this possible. Okay. No snow. We're back. And uh, let's see. We, uh, we just got a phone call come in from Jonathan Brown. Let's bring that into the studio here, Carmen. Hey, guys. Jonathan Brown out in Old Japan, New Jersey. You wanted to give you a heads up. The Tesla Model 3 looks like a four-door Aston Martin. It's sexy looking. It's quick. I'm anticipating 0 to 60 in four seconds or less, which equals my Corvette. I'm keeping the Corvette. I'm keeping the Cadillac. But I'm buying a Tesla S because it looks so good. It goes so fast. Um, it just happens to be electric. I did go autonomous mode too, by the way. I checked it out, <laughs> and uh, it's got its limitations. But I'm a driver. I never thought I'd dig it, but I do. So heads up, it's because it's sexy looking and quick. And oh, by the way, it just happens to be electric. Just giving you a heads up on why I got a uh, reservation number, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, Picking one up. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Well, good, Jonathan. Thanks for that. And, and for the dog barking in the background, dog too. Yeah. Well, look, he's, he's on to something. We've all driven electric cars. I love driving them. I love how quiet they are. I love that torque on, you know, the torque response in any speed. Just touch it and go. And, and the other thing that, that people haven't test driven a Tesla don't really get completely is that the whole experience is different. Like if you have a PC guy and the first time you you know use an iPad or an iPhone or something like that, it's a little weird at first. But when you live with it and whatever and you really make everything work, there's surprises and delights at every turn. And this coolness about that car that, that makes people devotees, that makes them line up to give a thousand dollars, you know, and you just, it's, like I say, it's hard to understand if you haven't been there a little bit. Right. Yeah. No, no doubt about it. Um, so what else, Gary? You had so, some, some other things. Well, there were the some, some management changes going on in, in the industry, both, uh, Europe, Asia and the United States. Uh, Carlos Ghosn. Carlos Ghosn. Yeah. Well, Carlos is, uh, 
you know, stepping down as CEO of Nissan. Yeah, so he was CEO of Nissan. He was CEO of the Renault-Nissan Alliance. And Renault. And, and Renault. And now CEO or chairman of Mitsubishi. Right. So he's just going to devote more time to making sure this alliance works. What's Did, your feeling on this Mitsubishi? Is I was just going to ask you that, Frank. To make this thing go or not? I... You know, Mitsubishi has been a failure for 30 years now. Yeah. 30 years. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, look, when Renault bought Nissan, everybody went, are they crazy? You can't do anything with it. And remember, Bob Lutz even said, why don't you just fill a ship up with gold bullion, sail it to the middle of the ocean, and throw the gold overboard? That's the same effect. Yeah. And, and dang, if Gowen didn't get it turned around. Yeah, but I, Mitsubishi... Word on the you know street is whatever that that's where the Mitsubishi group sent all their kind of dolts and idiots was to, to the car group and and the, you know the people that that worked there the, the few bright bulbs got so discouraged working there because I think for years it was kind of like well we need a write off for all the big profits we got elsewhere in the group and uh, the car thing over there whatever it, it was never you know expected to, to do great things and whatever. And boy, that sure looks kind of like what it is because they don't have anything that's really tops in segment. You know, what, what car do you just, you know, really recommend your friends go buy at Mitsubishi? It's, it's hard to see how that gets turned around if you've got a lot of staffing there that's just kind of not competitive. Yeah, I, I, look, the, the hard work's going to be on bringing the brand back. They'll be able to do the hardware and all that kind of stuff. So is, is, it, is it a brand problem just in the United States, or do you think in other parts of the world that it, it, it has the same sort of well, reputation? Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, as, as well aware of how they're doing elsewhere. I know, you know, the plug-in hybrid is one of the big best-selling, yeah. you know, things in Europe or whatever, uh, the, the SUV over there. Um, but... Just, uh, I don't know. For a long time, if you bought a Mitsubishi, you had all of the stigma of not buying American with none of the reliability halo of having bought Japanese. Right. You know, I think their quality's come up a, a little bit lately. But, you know, they'd have these sch schemes where it's like, if you can fog a mirror, you can get financing. And then all those cars came in. Zero, zero, zero. Yeah. They all, nobody paid right. the payments on them. They all came in on the hook. You know, I think. Was that yeah, the, because, you know, I, I mentioned the brand. It's also the dealerships, too, they got to bring back. And, and to your question, no, they don't do well in other markets. I, I want to say there is one area where they do well that is like Malaysia or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and uh, they, they make K cars in uh, Japan, right? And I think they do okay with well, that. So you, you mean the tiny little, the tiny tiny little, little cars, yeah, so 60cc and the AEI. If you look, if it, you know... Uh, economy scandal over there they were overstating oh. something right yeah yeah so yeah that's yeah well, i mean you saw carlos is you know taking some his off, yeah. Cut off yeah he's got taking some work off his shoulder so he can apply more work to to that whole thing and i just wonder does the world need uh, that many brands no if this was one that's not very good at this why don't we shut that down mm -hmm. well you know it's all about scale they all believe they got to have this manufacturing scale and acquiring mitsubishi gives them like another million units and now has put him you know, the Nissan, Renault, Mitsubishi Alliance, damn near right up there with Volkswagen, Toyota, yeah. and General Motors. I think they're actually in third place. They might be ahead of GM. Yeah. So the other big change was uh, John Mandel um, retiring from American Honda to be replaced by Jeff Conrad. That caught me by surprise. I didn't know it was coming. I guess he's uh, right at about, Mandel that is, right about uh, retirement age. You know, I, I don't see this at all of Honda pushing him out. I think he's been doing a bang-up job there. I mean, Honda yeah. in America is just like one well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's sort of funny, so to, to the point of, of Mendel's age. So he joined Honda in 2004, okay? So he's he's been there for a few years, right? He'd worked for Ford Motor for 28 years before that. I mean, so, so a lot of these guys in the car business really stick around for a long time. And, and one thing that I didn't know was that he had been executive vice president and chief operating officer for Mazda North American Operations. I did not. I don't remember that at all. Do something? not remember that. Wow. Very interesting. So, so Jeff Conrad, who's taking his place, had been the uh, senior VP and general manager of Honda Division. And... Uh, he joined Honda in 1982, 
and uh, he worked at Ford from 75 to 82, and he worked for Pepsi-Cola from 73 to 75. But uh, so, I mean, th this is just sort of seems to be a natural retirement. On our, this side of the fence, too, are kind of hoping that Bendel puts his arm around Conrad and says, hey, give those guys something quotable once in a while, not just the 100% party line, because that's kind of been, you know, the interviews from Conrad have never been quite as interesting as the ones from Mendel. So. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, too, the closer you get to retirement age, the freer you feel right. to speak your mind. <laughs> Yeah, and then plus, I mean, so so Mendel being the boss could sort of say things that the yeah. the underling would feel very hesitant to say. So maybe but, it'll be great. But I mean, I've, I've hopefully I've, no, but yeah. hopefully you're right. I've known Jeff for a long time. He's 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 a really nice guy and uh, good, you know, solid. So I think that this will continue. You know, as you were saying, it's uh, Honda's on the right path now, and they seem to be bringing the Civic back to a place that uh, the guys at Motor Trend would approve of. Absolutely. And uh, turbos. Type R okay. coming, and uh, yeah. so it's it's all good there. And okay, one other uh, personnel thing that we got to talk before we wrap up the show. Uh, Oliver Schmidt, Gary, you take it from there. Well, so Oliver was uh, being arraigned today in uh, federal court in Detroit. Um, what charged with eleven felonies related to uh, the Volkswagen diesel scandal, um, and. Uh, it was um, a conspiracy to defraud the public and the government in terms of uh, emissions. And, and the defraud part is where the Justice Department is really going to come down with like a ton of bricks. I, I'm hoping they're able to show, hey, I was just following orders. You know, I, I, I wanted to keep my job. I, you know, just being a good employee. I hope that it's not... It, it, it's, him it's, really plotting this whole thing out. I mean, it's, it's, but it sort of surprises me that, that you know, here's Oliver, and, and as we said before, I mean, we had him on the show before he Twice. went back to, yeah, but before, just oh. before he went back to Germany, and, and, uh, um, and what, he was on vacation in Florida, and then he was at the airport in Miami, he got arrested, he's been in, in, incarcerated since then, so early last month. And so here we are talking about this, this massive company that, was clearly involved in doing things wrong, and we got this one guy. I mean, that somehow that doesn't seem right to me. No, it isn't right. And, you know, part I'll of the reason... Call it right, don't you think? Well, the, the, look, the thing is, is that we don't have an extra extradition treaty with Germany. So if he hadn't come here for vacation, if he had gone to Mexico or Canada even for vacation, he'd be fine. But because we don't have an extradition treaty with Germany, they can't go after the other guys who really did approve all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Winter corn, probably, I'm thinking. Piek. I mean, this yeah. had to come I from a guy they, like him. Right. You know, who else can kind of say, you get this done or else? Right. And people maybe not even just think that the or else is you're fired. It might even be worse. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. So is, is he a scapegoat, do you think? Uh, no. Like I said, if he hadn't come here to the U.S., he would not be in prison today. Right. And not be uh, up for trial. These other, you know, who knows? Germany might just say, look, these, he, you, you want the guilty ones, America? Go ahead. We'll extradite them. Even though we don't have a treaty, they have to go stand trial. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how Germany wants to handle this. But... Yeah, it's, it's, to me, it's just very sad. Gary, I think it, you said it best uh, earlier. How could a guy who is so bright as Oliver, so entertaining, so engaging, such a worldly traveled person, get himself mixed up in the middle of this? It's, yeah. it's just not good. Okay, nice pregnant pause. Yes. It's time to wrap <laughs> up the show. <laughs> On a high note. Oh. That's right. Oh, what? oh, we got another phone call? Oh, oh okay. Uh, we're getting the, the high sign here from the, the control room. We've got another phone call. We may as well take it to not end on such a low There we go. We hope. Let's Maybe. bring it in. <laughs> yes, this is Dale Leonard from Cleveland, Ohio. I'll tell you, you know, everybody's knocking the Mitsubishi, but I'll tell you what, back in the day, I had a Mitsubishi 3000 GT. It might have been a nightmare to repair, but damn, it was a fast car. Hey, like always, guys, wonderful show. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks for that call. And they had the Evo, and that was, 
you know, I'm sure at some Look, point up, it'll up, be at the Amelia Island sure. Concours. Right? Mitsubishi was good up through the 1980s. It had really good industrial design. It had quite good technology. They, they were some of the first to really go into turbocharging and all-wheel drive in cars. Remember the twin-stick transmission? It was a nightmare, but it was engineering-wise very clever. They lost their mojo sometimes. Yeah, and, and, you know, I, I started my career July 1st, 1985 at Chrysler, and I really wanted a Conquest TSI. But I thought, oh, that's kind of cheating. It's not really a UAW car. I really should, you know. So I ended up buying, you know, a 2.2 turbo. Those things, those turbo engines, you, you try and find, these, find an original one with the original engine still? No. They all broke. And, you know, the, the V6s that we were putting in the Chryslers back in those days, those all blew smoke when they got to 80,000 miles. You think nobody else was doing it. You think, uh, you know, so maybe not even all the way through the maybe, maybe, maybe not even through that. <laughs> so, so was the 3000 GT that became the Stealth? Was that... that was also a Stealth. I thought the Stealth was better looking, too, of, of the two. Mm -hmm. But those were heavy cars. Yes, they were. Like 3,800 pounds or something like that for the all-in, four-wheel drive, you know, turbo ones. Mm. Real good. Well, not well, quite a high note. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but maybe not as depressing a yeah. one. Okay, well, let's do this again next week, Gary. Right, let's do that. And Frank, thanks so much for coming on the show. Always, Always great to have you here. Good. And, of course, we want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. We had some other things on the list, too. It was... Is there anything good there? <laughs> J.D. Power V vehicle dependability. Well, they haven't announced yet, have they? Yeah. Oh, it came out today? Yesterday. Oh, it did? Oh, I was traveling oh, I yesterday. That. Yeah, I was on the road yesterday, too. And what was this TomTom -tom on crowded streets? Oh, so they did a study, global study, and uh, I, was, I was sort of surprised at... Uh, Here somewhere. So, overall daily congestion level, extra oh. travel time for cities of over 800,000 people. So, what is the number one most crowded city in the world? LA. Not even close. Not even oh, the, no, globally, no, no. globally in the top 10. No, no, but it's funny you say that, Frank, because two studies came out. Yeah, one I of them said what, L.A. It was, yeah. it was the INREX was the other one. Yeah. Yeah, L.A. was at the top of one of them, and so Moscow L was the worst elsewhere. No, it was like so, somewhere like Malaysia? Or? Well, in, in the world, it's Mexico City. Huh. So the top 10, Mexico City, Bangkok, Jakarta, Kuang. There's Yi. another? Hey, we got another phone call. Go ahead, bring it in. Extra innings. Hi, this is Dick Lembitz from York, Pennsylvania. I've got a question about the new Honda Odyssey. Do you guys think that it's uh, redesigned well enough to compete with the new price to Pacifica? Thanks, and I'll listen for your answer. I'll tell you what, I was hugely disappointed in the back seats of that car. The of middle the row seats really? don't even fold all the way flat. You pretty much have to muscle those out if you want to carry anything big in an Odyssey. Oh, I wasn't aware I mean, of that. Chrysler managed to get theirs to fold into the floor, for Pete's sake. And these guys, this is about as far down as they go. That's just... For a minivan? That's pitiful. That's the cardinal sin. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. So but no. it is a Honda. It will be bulletproof. Yes, it, everything else will be I'm good. Sure. But I got to tell you, I like that Pacifica. It's pretty well done, and the, the plug-in hybrid, I, I yeah. didn't know that FCA had it in yeah. them to do it that well. Yeah, as soon as they made that, that plug-in, I thought, well, yeah, of course, you know, I don't really want to take a car a, a long trip in a Volt. There's, the back seat's cramped, there's not much room in it. I want to take a long trip in a Pacifica, right. so the, if I'm going to lug around a gas motor, let's have it in a car that can really go 
you know, to California and back uh, in comfort, mm -hmm. and then still drive around all week on electrics, uh, you know, alone. So, right. yeah, that that thing is neat. Yep. So, oh, Oliver Schmidt, wow, pleads not guilty. Boy, he doesn't look good in that photo. Of course, mug shots never mm -hmm. do look good, but. Uh, yeah, even a short stretch in the in the clink is not. Uh, yeah. Usually making you look better. Right. Man. Unreal. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention on the show, uh, we're going to start doing these 37 second. I don't want to call them car reviews. That's my staff says, especially don't call them car reviews, but it's going to be like I'm calling them car clips. Just 37. So, seconds. so what is the significance of 37 seconds? It's got a nice alliterative sound to it. Is that 140 seconds. characters when you, when you say them out? <laughs> Just about. <laughs> is it a video? Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, we were trying to come up with something like, how can we do something just different? And then I thought, well, it, shorter is better. Online, it's got to be video, number one, because that's where everything's going. And it's got to be short. And then I thought, 60 seconds. And then we were batting things around, and I think Chip was the one who came up with 37 seconds. And it was like, when you start writing for that, it's amazing how much you can say in 37 seconds. And you think, you know, most commercials on TV are 30s. This is an extra seven seconds. And, and it's funny, too. I, I actually really like Frosting. writing to that level. That I, I've always loved Twitter because I think it's a great writing challenge to say everything that you want to say in 140 characters and be understandable and, you know, uh, and I don't... Uh, you could I, run for president. <laughs> <laughs> Bigly, I could. Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg, right. Facebook doesn't have a limit, though. But, you know, I, I, I admire a lot of 30-second TV ads just based on how much information they can cram in there. And it's, it's video, it's graphics, it's sound, it's text, it's voiceover. And when you start combining all that together, it, you can say a lot in 37 seconds. Now, for, you know, like a, a brief online video. That's great. I'd much rather write something that's more in-depth and more explanatory and puts things better in perspective. But it's amazing what you can do in 37 mm -hmm. seconds. When does it start? Monday. All right. Gonna, Where are we going to be? going to be in daily? It, it's going to be, no, we'll, we're going to put it on our website. So it'll be and independent. Maybe we should throw one in daily so that people get uh, more exposed to it. But uh, yeah, no, we'll, uh, we've, we've got some of them in the can and we'll be putting up one or two a week after that, something like that, based on what we're driving. But uh, just figured we gotta do something different. If we try to do what everybody else is doing, how do you stand out? You don't, you gotta do something different. Cool. So what's your next trip? Geneva. I just got back from, you know, to go to Geneva with Porsche. They wanted you to go do a, a thing that I can't really talk about till six <laughs> uh, in Nardo uh, yesterday. Where's, oh, where's interesting. Nardo? Nardo, Italy, the big uh, high speed. Track. Yeah, you were just Porsche in Italy track. yesterday. Yeah. Well, uh, I came home yesterday. Yeah. Well, actually, it's so hard to get there that they we marshaled in uh, Munich, and there was a, a charter down a bag. So we spent the night in Munich mm -hmm. uh, Tuesday night. So. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it had high speed associated with Indeed. it. Because that's what I know about Nardo. Yeah. So very, very cool. How about you, Gary? Where are you, uh, what are you going to drive next? Um, CHR in Austin next week. Mm -hmm. That thing's got a Nicki Minaj romp on it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's what the kids want. That's what they do. Yeah. <laughs> Baby's got back. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And the one they had in Chicago had the um, two two tone paint scheme, like um, we were talking about. On a earlier. CHR? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And just like we were talking about in terms of the uh, compass. The compass, the, right? Yeah. yeah. They they also told. Yeah, they've got that same floating roof kind of thing going on yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Mark Allen told me the manufacturing people are not happy because they got to tape the car off to do that black roof down oh, yeah, eight yeah. pillars. And he says they haven't taped cars in who knows how long. Mm -hmm. And we should have mentioned that the uh, 
chief engineer on that was uh, uh, Art Anderson, whom we had on the show twice. Right. So I think he's he's one of the. We had him for 500x and for Renegade. Oh wow. Hmm. They're they're doing pretty good stuff here.